Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulih al-kareem Wa ala ahli wa ashabi Wa man istanna bi sunnatihi ila yawm al-deen All praises due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day ISIS is not Islam. This statement is a statement rejecting the way of Islam. What is distinct about that way? That way is fundamentally a middle way, a middle path, a balanced path, a path without extremes, St extremes from the perspective of the Sharia, of course, because some may consider things of the Sharia to be extreme. So when we're talking about avoiding extremes, we're talking about what is generally held to be extreme and in particular what Islam holds to be extreme. <coughs> so that middle path where Allah said وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَى In that way we have made you, have made you a balanced nation he stressed the responsibility of maintaining that balance. Because he goes on to say, لِتَكُونُ شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ So that you would be witnesses against humankind. وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا And that the messenger would be a witness against you for or against you. He outlined the details of that balance. So many hadiths you are already familiar with where people wanted to do extreme things like not getting married. He said, I got married. People wanted to fast every day. He said, I fast and I break my fast. People want to stay up all night in prayer. He said, I stay up and I sleep. And after all of that, he said, فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي And whoever desires a sunnah, a way other than my way, is not a true follower of mine. So he laid down the foundations in his lifetime his life was an example of moderation. Moderation based on revelation. <coughs> I always stress this. Why? Because others may say, cutting off hands, this is extreme. Marrying a nine-year-old, is it extreme? They may use a variety of other principles in Islamic law and declare them to be extreme. And those who uphold them are considered extremists. I am considered an extremist because I defended the Islamic uh, ruling on homosexuals. That those who are found in, in the act are punished by death. I defended it and explained why Islam holds that homosexuality is a deviance and it can never accept it as being good. Never. For that I was labeled an extremist calling for the death penalty of homosexuals. No, I wasn't calling in the West. I'm not going to England and UK, US calling people, go kill all the homosexuals you can find. No. I was just defending Islamic law. But for them, because the society has changed. 
So homosexuality now is looked at as an alternative lifestyle, a personal choice, which nobody has the right to oppose. So for one to say this is evil, that is extreme. So that's why we can't say, you know, that moderation is moderation acceptable globally. Much, I would say, 80% or maybe even 90% of what Islam holds as moderate, the whole world accepts as moderate. But there is that 10% or 20% which Islam holds as moderate and which was held by the rest of the world as moderate, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. But because they were changing all along, they no longer hold it as moderate. So that middle and balanced position that's why we have to say it is the balanced position according to revelation because we have to have a criterion if it's just up to what people feel what people think then that there's no criterion you've removed the basis for a criterion so it just becomes human desires so that basic principle of moderation <coughs> when we use it and apply it in our Islam, our practice of Islam in our daily lives this represents the true Islamic approach anyone, any group any movement which seeks to go beyond this which breaks away from the confines of Islamic moderation becomes extreme and Allah SWT himself told us in the Quran Ya Ahl al-Kitab La taghlu fi dinikum O people of the scripture do not go to extremes in your religion. Don't go to extremes in your religion. This was the instruction of Allah SWT. And the Prophet ﷺ told us, Iyakum wal ghulu, beware of extremism. It destroyed the people before you. So this has been the correct understanding of Islam and its teachings from the very beginning. However, shaitan, Satan, is busy. And his way is to make what was defined as extreme in Islam seem normal, seem good, seem right. For the non-Muslims, of course, he has a full playing field. Very easy to change people's way of thinking. And <coughs> but for Muslims, very difficult because they do have the Quran and the Sunnah. It has remained with them in spite of other issues that have come in terms of their practice, etc. There are issues there. We're not on the Quran and Sunnah the way the Prophet ﷺ said, bite on to it with your molars. No. Ah, we have it. We're toying with it. But at least we do have it amongst us. Quran and Sunnah. So it's not so easy for the satanic forces to be able to push Muslims into extremism. Not so easy. But in spite of the fact that it's not so easy, they have succeeded. They succeeded in the time of the Sahaba. In the time of the Sahaba, they succeeded. And their way is to use or misuse Islamic texts 
Because to get a Muslim to go and do something extreme, you have to support your claim, your call, whatever, with some evidence. You don't just say, let's go do this. Or you have to get some kind of evidence to support your line of action. So, the biggest example which we have from the time of the Sahaba, I'm just taking one because historically there are many other things that have taken place. We'll just take a few samples to understand the methodology of Hezbo Shaitan, the party of Satan, the Satanic party. Their methodology in the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib when he was chosen by the majority of Muslims to be the Khalifa he accepted it and there were discrepancies with Muawiyah who was the governor of Syria And they decided to avoid bloodshed, they would arbitrate. Somebody was chosen from uh, the followers, those who were with Muawiyah, and somebody was chosen from those who were with Ali ibn Abi Talib. And they met together to find a solution. When that took place, from the army of Ali, a group broke away. That group broke away on the basis of the verse la hukma illa lillah judgment belongs only to Allah a verse from the Quran judgment belongs only to Allah who can dispute that judgment belongs only to Allah of course but they now took that to mean that that decision for arbitration by Ali and Muawiyah went against the ruling of Allah. <coughs> so much so that they declared Ali and Muawiyah to be disbelievers. Because that is the bullet that the Hezbo Shaitan carries behind their extremism declare the believers to be disbelievers which then justifies them unleashing violence murder slaughter against Muslims in the name of Islam in defense of Islam so that group that broke away, we know them as the Khawarij. English, they call the Kharijites, the Khawarij. The seceders, those who broke away from Kharaja, which means to go out, left, Khuruj. But they didn't call themselves that. They called themselves Ashura. The buyers, those who traded their dunya for the akhirah, who were prepared to die, give their lives for the sake of the hereafter. That's what they call themselves. Sounds beautiful. And that's how shaitan operates. That's the name. You know, Allah speaks about that in the Quran. Of the highest level, one those who will trade their 
their dunya for the akhirah, you know, these are the ones who will be truly successful. This is where the true success lies. Being ready to sacrifice our dunya for the sake of the akhirah, this is the ultimate sacrifice. The believer should strive for. So they were named, they named themselves that. No different from when shaitan came to Adam and told Adam that that tree which Allah told you not to eat from, its name is the tree of eternal life. Allah never called it that. Allah never called it that. But that's how shaitan operates. He beautifies that which is forbidden. So it becomes something everybody wants. That's how he operates. Same thing today we are caught up in, and this is extremism, where riba, as cursed as it is in the Quran and in the Sunnah, to so many different degrees, which used to be known in English, it used to be called usury, which doesn't sound nice. They changed the name to interest. So it's now interesting. It is in your interest. Now it's beautiful. Same methodology, nothing new. So, as those, that early generation, we had those who broke away on the basis of the Quranic verse, La hukma illa lillah, and nobody denied the truth of that verse. But how they took that verse, they utilized it out of its context in a way which justified them to declare believers to be disbelievers. Misinterpretation of the Quranic texts. So these are the characteristics. You could identify them. One, misinterpretation of Quranic texts. <coughs> Declaring the believers to be disbelievers. Slaughtering the believers. These are the main features. Connected to that is harshness. They're very harsh. Because that process of declaring believers to dis be disbelievers is a very rough and r harsh way. Lacking mercy. Calling to hatred of the believers. Calling to hatred of the believers. These five principles you will see repeated time and time again. Whenever these movements driven by shaitan arise, you will see these same characteristics there. If we jump forward 1,400 years, and there are many in between, you had the Qaramita who attacked Mecca and took the bodies of the Hujjaj and threw them in the well of Zamzam, stole the black stone, took it away to Ahsa in Eastern Arabia for nearly 25 years. And of course, they thought they were righteous. What they were doing was good. The people whose bodies they were throwing in there were people who they declared to be disbelievers, etc. 
all the same factors were there up to the year 1980 fast forward in 1980 the Haram Masjid al-Haram was captured captured by a group that claimed it was led by the Mahdi and that group once the Haram itself was captured they started from the minarets of the Haram to shoot anyone who was wearing a uniform all the guards that were there to maintain order whatever of the Haram they were just up there <coughs> killing them one after another their blood had become halal they justified the taking of others lives based on hadiths of the Prophet ﷺ about the Mahdi which they brought to life and when you go into the depth of who were involved and how they got there you find among them people who are good people the one who was declared to be the Mahdi he was a third year student in the College of Sharia in Imam Ibn Saud University who was a known lecturer many people used to listen to his khutbas and due to the huge following which developed he was disallowed to give the khutbah in his masjid he went from masjid to masjid people would still find out where he was and eventually he was not allowed to give any khutbas <coughs> eventually his tapes the recordings of his lectures were banned and he ended up going to a village outside of Medina in the desert where he joined another group there a group that was already there who had decided they were going to apply Sharia in that village beginning from that village they had already declared the rulership of Saudi Arabia to be Kafirs and they were doing their bit for Sharia in the village and Shaitan put a thought in their minds that with the coming of 1980 that is the year 2000 7980 which was the year 2000 uh, for the uh, Islamic calendar right? the belief now this idea that the Mahdi it was time for the Mahdi to come so they were now readying themselves for the coming of the Mahdi so it's not 2000 1400 sorry, 1400 2000 is the uh, Gregorian calendar later so um, that idea circulated amongst them one of the leading individuals among them his sister dreams that she marries the Mahdi when this young Sharia student came from Riyadh joins the village she swears that's the one that I married in the dream <coughs> and they sought to convince him that he was the Mahdi he wouldn't accept it initially but eventually with enough people saying it you know what a good man you are you are righteous and so on so on all these other things eventually the weight 
convinced him. He married her, and they ended up in the haram, killing Muslims, slaughtering Muslims, hujjaj. Eventually, they were killed there. But the same principles, if you look into their movement, you see the same principles there. Fast forwarding to our time with ISIS. This is the new version. Before ISIS, we had Qaeda. And of course, there are issues about the Qaeda, are they really the Qaeda, where they're made up by America, whatever, whatever. The sum total is we have people saying the same thing. Boko Haram, Abu Sayyaf, we got a bunch of them. And they all share the same characteristics. They lack a very basic principle, which is talked, talked about in the very beginning, of the principles of gentleness. Islam is a gentle religion. It is a religion of rifq. And Aisha radiallahu anha quoted Prophet Muhammad sallallahu as saying inna rifqa la yakunu fi shay illa zana a gentleness whenever it is in anything it beautifies it wa la yunza'u min shay illa shana and whenever it is removed from anything it disfigures it. This is the statement of the Prophet. Now, once that gentleness is gone, then it is replaced by harshness, and evil comes with that harshness. Prophet Muhammad's life exemplified gentleness kindness this was his way so when we look at the group which is now called ISIS they had a number of different names till they reached ISIS now maybe it's just the IS Islamic State when we look at their arguments <laughs> And we have to remember, again, this is a group of Muslims. Those people in Mecca were Muslims. The Khawarij were Muslims. So, when we look at what is the basis of their claims, for example, <coughs> This uh, individual who was a aid worker, Alan Henning, you know, who was slaughtered on television, among many others, this individual was an aid worker. It's known. He's traveling in a convoy of Muslims to help Syrians. You know, he gave up his job situation back home and came there making that sacrifice. And then you slaughter such a person. You have to question what mentality, what happened here? Where did they go off? Well, the point is that if you go and look at the arguments which they use, One of the first statements that was made in response to people crying out and saying, how can you do this? This innocent aid worker, their initial response was, 
Those who say that he is an innocent aid worker forget that what makes his blood legal to spill is the fact that he's a kafir. That was their statement. This innocent aid worker, they say, it's not counted, he's a kafir. So being a kafir means that it is halal, it is permissible for us to take his life. However, of course, the whole of the Sharia is opposed to this idea. The idea that simply because somebody is a kafir you can kill them is foreign to Islam. This is what the non-Muslims, Christian missionaries and others use to distort the image of Islam. They say, yeah, you Muslims are, you know, for us disbelievers, we're halal, you can kill any of us, anytime. And in fact, they will even call on verses from the Quran, which they will use uh, to justify these claims. فَقْتُلُوهُمْ حَيْثُ ثَقِفْتُمُوهُمْ Kill them wherever you find them. But of course, all of these verses are in the context of warfare. You're in a battle. The enemy combatants, the enemy combatants, wherever you find them, you are instructed to kill them. They're fighting, they're trying to take your life, they're trying to take the life of Muslims. So it is perfectly legitimate to kill them. But it has nothing to do with the fact that they're disbelievers. It has nothing to do with the fact that they're disbelievers. Because even if a believer tries to kill you, and in your defense you kill that person, this is protecting your own life. So it has nothing to do with believer or disbeliever. This is a matter of war. Your life is threatened, your life is being taken, you can fight to defend yourself. And of course, they take statements of some of the scholars out of context, like Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah and others, to justify this slaughter. <coughs> And they will take, for example, other verses, Surah Tawbah, verse 5. Allah commanded us in the verse, it's called the verse of the sword. Then when the sacred months have passed, then kill the idolaters wherever you find them. Same thing. And the Prophet Sallallahu told us, you know, that we are commanded to fight the people until they accept Islam or pay the jizya. They say, this is, this is what we're allowed to do. We're just doing what the Quran and the, the Sunnah says. So of course these arguments, scholars have addressed these, these uh, verses and addressed these statements. And what they add to that of course is the verse of Qisas, Al Ain Bil Ain. You know, an eye for an eye. They add that to it. <coughs> and again, added it in their own way of interpreting it. Meaning, whatever these people have done, so they would say, because this person came from Britain. How many Muslims did Britain offer protection and then they went against them by imprisoning them, sending them to more hostile countries for punishment, you know? And uh, they would use the argument, say, well, listen, they killed Muslim children, people, you know, uh, our aid workers, they've killed us. All of this justifies them doing the same, what they say is the same, too. Others, the disbelievers. And they even use that, of course, against Muslims too. Recent uh, prisoners burnt alive and other Muslims who were also slaughtered. 
various groups of Muslims. All of this being justified with the principle of an eye for an eye, but the Sharia. Scholars of the Sharia are unanimous that the eye for the eye is limited to what is permissible Islamically and it is limited to the individual meaning that individual commits a crime if you say an American soldier rapes kills a family in Iraq there's some of them on trial now for doing that right they did that so retaliation is what that we go and do the same thing to them that's how they've interpreted it the same way that they treated us we're allowed to go and treat them the same way so some of our soldiers will go and rape their women and kill their families and this is total madness total madness and their call, of course, is to excommunication of Muslims, declaring Muslims to be disbelievers, which allows them to do the same thing with them. And they call for the hatred. That hatred, that harshness that we spoke of, that is at the foundation of their call. So we know these are the signs which indicate to us that they are misguided. Besides the fact that they don't have any scholarship with them. They don't have any of the leading scholars of the Ummah saying, yeah, you're right. What you're doing is correct. Across the Ummah, from one end to the other, are opposed. You do have some individuals who are of questionable scholarship may be very popular amongst the people because they spoke a lot and people like the way they speak and they may offer support but scholars of the ummah no they are unanimous in condemning this group and what happens of course is when the ummah is ignorant their, their knowledge is low, weak, then they can play on the emotions, play on the emotions of the people. So they will take some pictures from Palestine, the time of Gaza, the Israeli bombardment, etc. And they'll show you pictures of babies with their heads blown off and all these kinds of things. And of course, after you've seen a few of these, I mean, your heart is on fire. You want to do something. So they'll say, help us. Pay back. Strap these bombs around yourself. You know, go into this supermarket or go into this whatever and blow them up. Get back at them. And you, Though that may not have been your mentality before, after seeing enough of these pictures, you know, your heart is on fire. You want to do something. You know, you feel something should be done. And they provide this option for you. And you find yourself killing yourself and killing others. Innocence. So, they are able to do this because of the fact that we don't know Islam properly. If we were clear on Islam, on the Sharia, etc., it's not possible. They can only do it when people are ignorant. And they will bring Quranic verses, bring hadiths, arguments to round people up. And they have a Steady flow of people coming from different parts of the Muslim world. And in order to enhance their position and their claim, this individual, al-Baghdadi, claims to be the Khalifa. And this is the other 
thing which all Muslims feel, you know, sad from the time 1925 when the Khilafah was disbanded in Turkey, the end of the Khilafah, even though it was already corrupted and all these other kinds of things. But it was a unifying point of focus for Muslims globally. And so Muslims have always aspired, wished for it to come back. So they raised this beautiful image, the Khalifa. And of course there are hadiths. Man mata wa laysa fi unuqihi bay'a mata baytatan jahiliyya. Whoever dies and is not in bay'a to the Khalifa dies a death of disbelief. So, this hadith statement of Rasulullah So they're playing on again the emotions of Muslims. Yes, the Prophet did say that. But the death that he spoke of when he said whoever dies and is not engaged in a bay'ah dies a death actually it says of the time of ignorance he dies a death of the time of ignorance it doesn't mean he dies a death of a disbeliever but that's the way they portray it mata metaten jahiliya the death of the time of ignorance of course that's when when the disbelievers dominated jahiliya pre-islam pre-islamic times but so what did that mean it didn't mean he died a disbeliever it just meant that as in the time of jahiliya people didn't have bayah he dies like that time not that he himself is a disbeliever but that's how they take it so then if you're if you've got this interpretation they put it on you you have to make bay'ah and that's what they say if you don't make bay'ah to their khalifa then you are a disbeliever in fact your state is between disbelief and belief if you never heard of the khalifa that's how they put it you know you're you're not considered to be a believer or a disbeliever you're in limbo once you hear about the Khalifa and you don't make bay'ah, you're a disbeliever. So this is their methodology. Playing on the emotions, playing on the ignorance, misusing Quranic verses, hadiths, etc. taken out of context. This is their standard methodology and it is the methodology of shaitan so there's no doubt that there are satanic forces driving this movement whether they were created by the west as some people feel and might be or they were muslim creations utilized by the west for their own purposes, to distort the image of Islam, etc. However, the end result is still, it is a movement driven by satanic forces. So, what is our responsibility today? That's the point. If ISIS is not Islam, then what do, or what should we do? For one, what is obvious is that for those in our ranks who have been fooled by the da'wah of ISIS, then we have to try to help them, to bring them back to the proper understanding. But to be able to do that, we have to have the proper understanding. We have to be clear on these matters Islamically. Because if we are confused, we just kind of feel it's wrong, it doesn't feel right, then if you get in arguments with somebody who is clever, they know how to use the right words in the right way, 
push the buttons that are necessary, then you become one of their followers. Even though you went in with the intention of trying to discourage them, you end up becoming one of their rank. You know? Because it's only knowledge that is going to protect you. So therefore, it is essential. This is the starting point. To seek correct knowledge of Islam. <coughs> From A to Z, whatever is needed by you to be able to live a proper Islamic life, then that is what is obligatory on you. As the Prophet ﷺ had said, Talabul Elmi Farid Allah Kulli Muslim. Seeking knowledge is obligatory for every Muslim. That much you need to know. Because if you don't have that basic knowledge which would protect you from ISIS, then it means your knowledge of Islam is faulty. <clears throat> and if it's you got away from ISIS, somebody else is going to catch you. You had Arkham here before, right? People were caught. And there will be others. So how do we protect ourselves? It is only ultimately through knowledge. Here, just pass it here and pass it over. I think they didn't receive it. Huh? So, Alhamdulillah, you have Yaya San Ta'alim. If this is the first time that you're coming here, then know that this is an institution in which knowledge is being imparted in the main languages used here. And it shouldn't be that you just pop up for talks. Dr. Bilal's coming, okay, let's come, let's hear him. I've never seen him before, I just saw him on YouTube. I had to see him in person. <laughs> we, we need to be beyond that. We need to be here because we know that being here and seeking knowledge here is putting ourselves on a path to paradise. It is that great. Because Prophet Muhammad said, Man salaka tariqan yaltamisu fihi ilman sahalallahu lahu tariqan ilan jannah. Whoever takes a path in which he or she seeks knowledge, Allah makes the path to paradise easy for them. That is the promise of the Prophet So that's why we need to come and take advantage of the various classes that are available here. These classes without any kind of fees and things like this is, and very knowledgeable local scholars here teaching international scholars coming through from time to time. This is a wonderful opportunity. An opportunity, you go back a generation and the average Muslim didn't have that opportunity. You know, it was much more difficult. Allah has made it easier for you. So it is your duty, your responsibility to get it for your own benefit as well as for the benefit of your family, etc. Because you may be sitting here and have understood what I said, but your children, if that knowledge is not passed on to them in a proper way, next thing you know, you'll find your kids in Syria. You know? You see the families of those, ki those uh, kids that went uh, from the UK? Uh, the families, they were shocked. They were in a state of shock. You know? They didn't expect it. 15 year old girls, 16 year old girls going to be you know, jihadi brides. Adventure. You know? See, they were caught with, that, with the dawah uh, playing on their emotions. You know, to be the wife of a mujahid. They don't know, don't realize that there are so many who went there with these intentions to fight for the sake of Allah. When they came to realize that they're here killing Muslims, and they wanted to get out. They were being killed. 
So it's clear. If you try to leave, you're dead. You are rejecting the Khalifa, then you become a Kafir. No matter how hard you were fighting before with us, but you decide you want to stop, you want to go back to UK or US or anywhere, now you are labeled a disbeliever and your blood becomes halal. So there are people there, many, who want to leave, but they can't. That's a death sentence. But when do you find out? After you get there. <laughs> you know, that's what happens. It's too late. You're caught. So it is an obligation on us to take advantage of the opportunities that are here, to spread that knowledge amongst our families, etc., to protect them from the dangers, these types of dangers of extremism in this way. This is a particular form of extremism, one of the most deadly and dangerous forms. And alhamdulillah, uh, Allah blessed me to be able to set up the university, the Islamic Online University. This is the um, poster for it, roll up for it. The Islamic Online University makes it even another step easier. Because some of you might complain, well, I don't have, you know, the time to come here to Yaya Santa Alim all the time, and you know, so many times in a week, I'm only I'm too busy, children and whatever, work and all this. Islamic Online University, with over 200,000 students, in the last seven years, went from zero students to 200,000 students registered all over the world accessing knowledge at their leisure. You don't have to even leave your house. Everybody's already connected to the internet. You know, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on whatever, all these different things. We have time, we find time to do these things. We need to also find time to increase our knowledge, Islamic knowledge. Islamic Online University offers free courses, absolutely free. There is, of the 200,000 students, 196,000 of them study for free. I know, because when you heard 200,000, you made a calculation in your mind, this guy must be a millionaire. <laughs> I'm not. Not anywhere near it. I'm just, as they say, an average Ahmed. The 4,000 who pay fees for the bachelor's programs, which are minimal fees, $100 a semester, right? that is $800 for an accredited bachelor's. It's nothing. They pay for the 196,000 were studying for free. Because the goal of the university is to spread Islamic knowledge. To carry it as far and as wide as possible. This is the goal. It's not about making our millions. Nobody's making any millions. But Alhamdulillah, Allah has given us the opportunity to spread that knowledge. So we have Sharia. You want to know Sharia? Before you had to get accepted in the Middle East. You had to go learn Arabic so many years. Women, no chance, boom. Men, only certain groups. Only a fraction who would love to get there. Now, it's open. Alhamdulillah, you can study in Sharia. Study it in English, along with Arabic. And alhamdulillah, the women have risen to this opportunity and grabbed it. Because virtually every semester when we do a look at our top 10 students, eight out of the top 10 are women. Some semesters, 10 out of the top 10 are women. No men in the top 10. Alhamdulillah. So it is a wonderful opportunity. We have the Sharia, 
and from last year we also started a bachelor's in psychology some people ask oh why why psychology you know isn't there somebody isn't it better to have a, a bachelor's in hadith or tafsir so many other why psychology it's Islamic online university is a question well the problem is what that if you were to ask where are the Islamic psychologists you don't gonna find any you ask around maybe there's some people with degrees in psychology but you ask them are you an Islamic psychologist they'll admit no the psychology I studied was the same psychology that is studied in the US in the UK it's secular psychology we offer Islamic psychology that is comparative psychology from an Islamic perspective looking at what the West has and comparing it to Islamic teachings choosing what is correct and leaving what is not understanding why it isn't and the importance of psychology is that this science this is the science uh, which deals with counseling the science of counseling I had added this course to the Sharia course because when people come back from studying in Medina Mecca Azhar. People think, okay, the Sheikh is back. Let's take our problems to him. And of course, yeah, he knows Sharia, halal, haram. But there are so many problems which are between. They're in the gray areas. They're not halal and haram anymore, clearly. They require a knowledge of human psychology. So the Sheikh comes back and he really doesn't have the answers. He does his best, tries to give you advice, but without being a trained psychology, it means he's going to do what? He's going to make a mess. Yeah. Wasn't his intention, but that's the fact. He will make a mess. Later on, after 20 years of being a Sheikh, eventually wisdom kicks in. He's wise now. He learned from his mistakes. So now he gives advice with hikmah, with wisdom. He is a counselor, he's capable now. But in those 20 years, how many people's lives did he mess up? This is the point. So psychology is critical, a critical area. Similarly, we added a bachelor's in education. Again, training teachers, teachers for our schools. And we need teachers, people who are teachers, not merely because that's the only thing they could do. That tends to happen. People you go into teaching after you can't get into any of the other fields, you know? So instead of getting the cream of the crop, we're getting the bottom of the barrel. And they become our teachers. So then what do we expect in school? And approaches to education. How is education to be implemented? Is it just according to the way the West teaches? We just learn techniques in teaching and we teach the same material? If we don't change the material, and the approach to teaching that material, then our society will never change. I was just recently at a talk which I gave in the masjid or musalla with students from different parts of the world, Muslim world, locals as well as people from overseas. And I was giving them a talk. And and part of the talk 
I, I raised a question to them. These are all Muslim students. And they're active students. They were concerned, that's why they were there in the masjid for the Islamic talk. So I asked them this question, who among you can raise your hand and say, Wallahi, I have never cheated in any examination or test. Not one single hand went up. This is a product of miseducation. I can't blame them. But this is a product of miseducation. It means there's something wrong with the educational system. If the Prophet ﷺ had said, Man, Man minna, whoever cheats is not a true Muslim, how could it be that these students, Muslim students, conscious Muslim students from all parts of the Muslim world, including students from here, students who did their high school in Islamic high schools. And they couldn't say they never cheated. It means there's something wrong. Wrong with what is being taught and how what should be taught is being taught. It's a major problem. Because as I said to them, the main problem that we as Muslims complain about all over the world, every country I've been in, Muslims complain about what? Corruption. Corruption. Up, down, sideways, everywhere. Isn't it? And it's killing our countries. We cannot grow. Corruption is such an evil. It's eating away at any kind of progress that we can make. It's killing us. Corruption. But, as I said to them, do you think you can change it? You who couldn't raise your hand on that level, if you have on that level not able, what's going to happen now when you graduate and you get into a position? You're not going to be a part of the solution. You will be a part of the problem. <coughs> so this requires major change, a major different approach to education. A whole different approach. An approach primarily which is a moral approach. Because that's the essential message of Islam, is one of morality. So we need to bring morality back into the classroom. And obviously only Muslim teachers are going to be capable of doing that. Who have learned what the West has to offer, comparatively speaking, understood what is the Islamic approach, etc., etc., then they know how to tackle their subjects and be able to bring it from a moral perspective, or bring a moral perspective to everything that is taught. So every single class, moral messages are given. So imagine your school that went from kindergarten to grade 12. Every single class, whether you're doing maths or science or English or whatever, moral messages are being taught. The student that graduates from that system Will he be like the students that are graduating now? No. He will be a different person altogether. He will be a person who has a clear moral compass. One who you couldn't bribe. And they are the ones who will change the society. Because what is it that made the generation of the Prophet ﷺ good? That way they were able to change, turn the tide of history. What made them? It was that. They were driven by the moral principles of Islam, the morality that lays at the foundation of Islam. As a whole, they were not corruptible. Yes, there are individuals who did get corrupted, they're human beings. But in general, 
they were raised morally sound Islamically so they were able to make change and that's the only way that we can go forward so this is why we need Muslim educators who are conscious of this responsibility who can work together and make this change and we also added uh, the um, studies in Islamic banking and finance because this is of course a big area which Muslims are faced with they need to have this knowledge so we have this available now and we offer Arabic Arabic training people to teach Arabic to non-native speakers of Arabic not studying Arabic for the sake of Arabic and we also have a very well established Quran memorization center with over 25 hufaz with hijazas mainly from Egypt who are teaching with our program online Alhamdulillah for those who are keen on memorizing the Quran and teaching it so the Islamic Online University is here for you I am the founder and chancellor of the university and I encourage all of you to take the free courses use it to help build your own areas of knowledge because whatever field you're in you need Islamic guidance you need clarity you need to know what is acceptable Islamically and what is not and what you need to do to be a part of trying to change the society as the Prophet as Allah SWT had said in the Allah la yughayru ma biqawmin hatta yughayru ma bianfusihim Allah will not change the condition of the people until they change themselves so that change of self has to be based on knowledge it's not just it's not on philosophy you know and it's not just on dhikr some people say well, it's dhikr you know Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'inul qulub wala dhikrullahi akbar so it's about dhikr so you know you say la ilaha illallah 10,000 times every day you will be flying spiritually but reality yes we are encouraged to make dhikr but dhikr is not just saying la ilaha illallah dhikr is studying dhikr is teaching dhikr is buying selling dhikr is involved in all of that remembrance of Allah whenever we do anything in a way which is pleasing to Allah we have remembered Allah So we don't want to restrict it just to words that are repeated. So, Alhamdulillah, you have this opportunity. The university is there for you. It was created for you. Take the opportunity, learn, and teach others. The website, you can get it from the administration here, or if you want to write it down, it's www.iou.com. Edu. Dot gm. Inshallah, this was the um, essence of what we wanted to share with you this evening. In summary, we said ISIS is not Islam. It does not represent Islam. It doesn't mean that those people who are involved are not Muslims. To say, ah, oh, they're all disbelievers, again, we've gone to our own extreme. We've gone to an extreme here. They are misguided Muslims. That much we can say. They're misguided Muslims. They do not represent what they're doing, what they're calling for, does not represent Islam. Because it goes against the teaching of the Quran and the Sunnah as it has been understood by the Ummah. When you take those teachings out of context and you create your own understanding, then of course, you can produce anything. You can make halal haram and haram halal. Doing that. And that is why when we say we follow the Quran and the Sunnah, it's not enough just to say we follow the Quran and Sunnah. We need to, under, we need to add to that. We, under, we follow the Quran and Sunnah as it was understood by the Sahaba. <coughs> the early generations 
Not as we can come up with today, because people can come up with all kinds of understandings. Understandings which are in clear contradiction to the teachings of Islam. So, inshallah, I'm going to stop here. I hope the message is clear. You'll be given a chance to ask some questions. No? I've been told no. What happened? We ran out of time? Another time? Mm. Okay. Anyway, my Facebook page, you can be welcome to add your questions there. Dr. Bilal Phillips on Facebook. Barakallahu alaikum. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu ilaha 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 il